Pamatake api chante washe nape che yuzapi Michaela Madrid amachi api. Hello, my relatives. I greet you all with a good heart and a handshake. I'm Michaela Madrid, a program manager at Native Governance Center, and I'm calling in today from Heisapa, the beautiful homelands of the Osheti Shakoan. On, on behalf of NGC, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Native Governance Center is a Native-led nonprofit that supports Native nations in strengthening their governance systems and capacity to exercise their sovereignty. We encourage you to learn more about our programming by visiting our website, nativegov.org, or by following us on social media at NativeGov. Today's virtual event, TikTok and Sovereignty, Learning from Indigenous Content Creators, will explore how Indigenous content creators are using TikTok to raise awareness about tribal sovereignty and advance narrative change. We'll hear from a panel of Indigenous content creators about their real life experiences using the platforms to educate and activate. When we decided on this topic, I was really excited to explore the diverse ways that our Indigenous relatives are creating positive change through social media. As you'll see today, we need to engage in as many different methods, channels, and practices as possible to make that change happen for our communities, and our panelists are a great example of just that. Before we dive into our content, I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items. First, I'd like to remind you all to submit questions for our Q&A portion by using the Q&A box on Zoom, or for those of you on Facebook in the comment section. We'll transition to Q&A around 1245. This event is being closed captioned. If, you des if desired, you can turn it on by using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Finally, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Thank you for our first full event series sponsor, Anderson Realty, a boutique real estate brokerage with a 60 year tradition that's simple, work hard and put people first. We're also grateful to our friends at Carleton College for sponsoring us again this year. Carleton is committed to pro providing a true liberal arts education, a curriculum that challenges their students to learn broadly and think deeply. And we're not done yet. We're thankful for API Group, a market leading business services provider of safety, specialty and industrial services for supporting our full event series as well. Thank you as well to the University of St. Thomas. St. Thomas educates students to be morally responsible leaders who think critically, act wisely and work skillfully to advance the common good. And finally, big thanks to Bremer Bank for supporting this event. We're going to start today's event with a short presentation on TikTok and sovereignty basics, and then we'll follow it up with a panel discussion. So the first thing that we wanted to talk about is what is sovereignty? Before we jump into this conversation about TikTok, we figured we should probably start with the basics. So let's define sovereignty. Sovereignty is the natural right of a people to govern themselves. Sovereignty means that Native nations operate as independent nations within settler-occupied lands. Native nations exert their sovereignty to govern their citizens. They have their own constitutions, laws, elections, and infrastructure designed to meet their people's needs. Native nations have always been and always will be sovereign. Sovereignty is not granted, rather it's recognized. So now that we understand sovereignty at a basic level, um, let's do a few basics on TikTok and more specifically native TikTok. So starting with TikTok, for those of you who don't know, TikTok is a short form video sharing app that allows users to submit videos ranging in length from three seconds to 10 minutes. TikTok currently has over a billion monthly active users and the hashtag native TikTok has 12.3 billion views as of this week. TikTok has a huge reach globally and is available in more than 160 countries. To get more specific, indigenous TikTok influencers are using the platform to challenge negative stereotypes, advance native narrative change, and share information about culture and language, mobilize their communities and the broader public, and more. We've brought together four indigenous TikTok creators to share their knowledge with you. We're so excited to learn from them and how they're using the platform to spread knowledge and build indigenous power. And now it is my great honor to introduce our moderator for today's panel. Let's all welcome our host Sutton King. Sutton will kick off our panel discussion and I'll leave it to her to tell you a little bit more about herself. So take it away, Sutton. Thank you, Michaela. Mm, poso sakoli. 
Sutton King, Naktau, Pinuki, Nukats, Ungwa, Hawaii, Ni'i, Vagneta, Nawagitalota, Oniota Aga, Ni'i. Hello, relatives. My English name is Sutton King. My Menominee name is Naktau Pinuki. I'm Afro Indigenous and a descendant of the Menominee and Oneida Nations of Wisconsin. Um, I would describe myself as an Indigenous rights activist. Um, and a social entrepreneur really dedicated to developing um, and scaling innovative solutions to support Indigenous health equity across a number of sectors. For the last decade, I've really spent my time implementing culturally appropriate and equitable methodologies um, within healthcare, uh, technology, and philanthropy. And my commitment really in this last decade has really been looking at these innovation, innovative solutions to support mental health, uh, women's rights, drug policy reform, and bioculture conservation, as well as access and benefit sharing for Indigenous peoples globally. Um, as the co-founder of Urban Indigenous Collective, which is situated in Lenape Hoking, uh, so-called New York City, uh, we're an Indigenous-led public health NGO, and we're really supporting access to culturally tailored health and wellness services uh, for self-identified Indigenous peoples in Lenape Hoking and the greater uh, New York City, so the tri-state area. And we're doing this through a number of ways, community-based participatory research, advocacy, programming. And now that we have our first community center that opened this summer, um, we're really uh, planting the seeds for direct services. So we're really excited about that and this opportunity to be in support and service of our, of our community. And I think in an age where technology bridges the gap and amplifies voices, I think a platform like TikTok really has emerged as this really powerful tool for communities worldwide, um, and especially for our Indigenous communities, really seeking to preserve our culture and advocate for our rights and really be able to engage with a global audience. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce our panelists, um, who I believe have been instrumental in really leveraging uh, this potential of social media and platforms like TikTok to really support indigenous empowerment and sovereignty. Um, their expertise, as we're going to hear, uh, really ranges across uh, a lot of different intersections. Um, and so we're really excited to just be able to dive in. So let's go ahead and start with some introductions. Um, Christina, if you'd like to kick it off for us. Hi, Yatesh, Kadosh, and Asha, A Christina Haswood, Yinisha, Koda Chitni Nishan, the Bethlehem, Bushes Chitna, Ajatapaha, the Shacheki, Ania Shnella. Hello, my name is Christina Haswood. I'm Navajo and Bitterwater born for the Black Sheep people. My maternal grandparents are the Zuni Edgewater. My paternal grandparents are the Towering House people. I'm originally from Topic in Arizona, so in Scripture House, Arizona, but was born and raised here in Lawrence, Kansas. I am currently a state legislator. Here in the state of Kansas, representing House District 10, um, and happy to be here. And Shay, if you'd like to introduce uh, yourself. Hello, everybody. My name is Shay Jim. I am um, I am uh, Navajo Dene on my father's side and my mother's side, I'm Nishinaabe. Um, Odawa, so uh, it'd be Odawa Nishinaabe. Torechini Bashishchi, Nakai Dene Bashishche, the best is in the Shana. Um, I'm from Flagstaff, Kiklani, Arizona, uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, super happy to be here. And uh, we share the same clans, uh, Christina, by the way. I saw that, I was, I was freaking out. I was like, what? What is this? Super cool, relative. Oh, But happy to be here, happy to be part of this discussion, and I'm excited to see what uh, comes of this. So thank you for having me. Mm, Yako, thank you for that intro. Uh, Simona, uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Simona Barakab. I'm an Afro-Indigenous anarchist and citizen of the Fort Peck Assiniboine Sioux Tribes, born for the Nakota, Dakota, and Mono Nations. Uh, my clans are the Bear Clan, Kunu Paddler Band, and Red Bottom Clan. And I am super excited. Honestly, I've been fangirling over you forever. Everybody's tagged me and all, all your stuff. And it's just great to finally see you face to face and have a conversation with you. Oh my gosh, thank you for your work. And I'm so excited to be able to share this virtual space and dive into this conversation. I've been really just looking forward to this all week. So I'm glad it's here. Same. So one of my first questions really here is how are we currently using TikTok? I mean, we're all doing really great work for Indian country and our communities globally. Um, I'd like to just kind of kick it off with that first question. How are you leveraging this platform? What does that look like for you in, in your day to day and your work? And this is a question for everyone. So whoever wants to jump in. Uh, 
Well, I've been using it as a means of uh, raising social awareness on issues that are important to me. Like right now, um, I'm currently involved in the Bring Chanel Home campaign. And since ICWA just passed, you know, it's uh, was just recently upheld, it, it became really vitally important um, to make sure that we continue protecting our children. And a lot of people hadn't heard about what was going on with this little girl. So those are ways that I use it. Thank you. It's so important that we're able to really engage community through these platforms and really make sure that there is that public awareness of what's happening in policy and how that's affecting us. Thank you for, for sharing that. And thank you for your work. I can go next. Um, so I have been using my TikTok. Um, the whole goal of it was to basically bring representation of Indigenous folks, Native folks to politics and a civic engagement. Um, I consider myself a late bloomer um, into politics. Um, and then running for office, I felt this responsibility to try and get more of our Indigenous folks civically engaged and interested and most importantly, run for office um, and hopefully kind of break down some of the complications of politics and the barriers. I remember not so long ago where big concepts, um, big topics that you read about in the media um, were just so very daunting to digest. And even the process of being civically engaged is such a privilege on its own. How can we make this more accessible? How can we make this more understandable? Um, because a lot of this um, policy and politics, as, as Native folks know, that we don't really have a choice. Our livelihood, our families, our ancestors, um, the way that this United States government system set up, we are political entities. So a lot of policies do impact us from the federal level, be through Congress, through allegations, through funding to our tribal nations at the state level where someone like me who is an urban native person who lives outside of their reservation, a lot of state policies do fall and um, protections do fall in that category from our local levels, city council, counties to school boards where our children um, are facing an uphill battle to learn indigenous histories in their schools. Um, so that's a little bit of how I use TikTok to promote tribal sovereignty um, and try and get more folks civically engaged. Mm, thank you for your leadership and thank you for just sharing how, you know, it can kind of seem scary when we're considering civic engagement. How do we, you know, take up that space or reclaim that space rather and really understanding that, yeah, they are very large concepts, but with TikTok, we can really use it as a tool to educate our communities and share, no, you have a right to the seat and here are the ways that you can do that. So it's beautiful how you're, you're utilizing that in a way of an educational tool and really being able to really support the next generation of leaders and, you know, again, reclaiming that space. So thank you so much. Che, and how are you using TikTok? What does that look like for you? Well, you know, um, so I really go back to, um, I guess to kind of break it down shortly, right? I think the, the big thing for me is lifting this veil of invisibility that we have as Indigenous people, right? Like for a long time, historically speaking, we've had a lot of, you know, we're one of the least represented. We're one of the, you know, like I heard someone say it, like we're one of the only people in the planet that are really outcasted in our own homelands, right? And so, uh, but when I was going back like years ago, prior to TikTok, prior to the time that we were living in currently, we had the Standing Rock movement. Right. And that was something that for me was a huge kicking off point. It was a huge activate activation for me personally. And what I one of the biggest uh, takeaways I took from that from that situation from that time was the power of social media, right? the power of independent journalism, the power of being able to tell our own story and have our own narrative that doesn't doesn't need to be completely dependent on outside sources, right? Through major news network outlets or or what have you, right? We're really, by the first time we saw the power of social media being leveraged in a way to bring, not only bring attention and resources and support for the things that we face as indigenous people, not only with, you know, with these particular situations like Standing Rock, but, um, but with sovereignty overall, right? Tribal uh, politics, um, you know, uh, community issues that we face, um, and education. And it was, the, it, was the, it was something that for me was very impactful. And I realized in order to get to 
the younger people who are, are going to be our future leaders, who are going to be those sitting in our in our in our in our seats uh, as leaders of our of our nation and of our country, that it's vastly important that we go that we can go to them, right? Go to where they're at, meet them where in their space. And for the younger generations, it's social media, it's the virtual space, and be able to build this huge, very um elegant uh multi-layered networking that we have amongst all of our nations and all of our people for non for indigenous and non-indigenous people alike to have this this platform where we're able to, to, to again to tell our own stories and hear it directly from from the source rather than again like i said seeing how we've how we've done that in the past and so for me personally that was one of the huge motivating factors of what brought me to this platform to begin with and something that i always keep in mind like that's this is where the younger people are this is where you know with that with 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 the younger people as they are they, their minds are being shaped and molded now and so we have to be able to meet them in their spaces and for people who don't live in tribal communities who don't live on reservations right i think most of our indigenous people do not live in native quote unquote native communities and so we have to find them in in their space where they're comfortable at and it, it could be a very good um leeway or segue into you know heavier involvement um and education so so powerful thank you so much and you know it's it's so important you know this this point that you're bringing up of really meeting our community where they're at right understanding 70 percent of us now live in urban areas right a large majority of this younger population is on TikTok, and i i have to say you know um our the urban indigenous collective did not have a TikTok until our first communications manager came on who's you know in her 20 somethings and it was like we need to be on TikTok. and you know me as a little bit older is like okay i believe you right um and you know i'll share a challenging um uh, example that i had is i remember uh, before i got into social entrepreneurship um i was a director of an urban program and i kept saying you know instagram we need an instagram you know we need to be on facebook we need to be on these social media platforms and i kept really meeting this resistance from from this older leadership who never did it in that way, right? But slowly began to understand that these tools are so important in really being able to meet our community where they're at, especially in this, this virtual world. And so next, I just kind of want to talk about some more specific stories and examples of how you've been using um, TikTok to really advance tribal sovereignty. You know, I've heard ICWA and I've heard Standing Rock and I've heard civic engagement, but what does that content look like for you all? You know, what goes behind that and what does that engagement look like? What are you, what are you seeing or what are you thinking about when you're creating that content? I can jump in. Um, so for me, I try to break down the issues. Um, and it's been a little bit of trial and error. The first TikTok I've ever made was like a screen share of how to get registered to vote here in the state of Kansas. Um, and it didn't really go that well. Um, what we, I've learned from creating TikToks is it needs to be short. It needs to be concise. Like we don't need to do the millennial pause. I'm 29. So I try to not do the millennial pause um, and really try to just make it engaging as much as possible. Um, so a lot of times with ICWA or with um, Missing More Indigenous Peoples legislation, I will try and break it down um, concisively, ideally less than 60 seconds on what's going on, what's happening, um, and advocate those issues that way. I also try to, um, all across my social media platforms, tag other Indigenous businesses um, and try to drive that foot traffic to um, indigenous businesses. I really see TikTok be utilizing for indigenous entrepreneurs, which I absolutely love, but also cultural sharing. Um, and most recently I made a TikTok um, because I live in the Kansas area and the whole um, Kansas City team, Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. Um, I took the opportunity with the hype to educate folks on why um, some natives feel like we need to do the name change and what's so problematic about the Kansas City team. Um, and just breaking that down quickly in a little bit of clip, click baby, I will admit, <laughs> um, just try to grab people's attention and share my perspective because I feel like on another platform like Twitter where I'm just like, please change the name, stop the chop, um, it doesn't really give the full context of, of the problem itself. So I feel like TikTok does help that, but I mean, you know, you can use other platforms uh, for necessary to help 
educate on the issue. That's right. And it sounds like, you know, you're really seeing it as this platform to be able to dive deeper into the issues. Like we said before, really providing more education, but it sounds like making them short, concise, uh, not doing the millennial pause is really important there. But also something that's really interesting, like you said, when there's some buzz happening culturally and globally, being able to use it as a moment to really elevate some of the issues we're holding and really wanting to amplify that message. That's really great. I love that. I love that. Um, che or Simona, do you have any uh, examples of how you're leveraging um, your, your content creation to support sovereignty specifically? What does that look like for you all? Yeah, I can jump in real quick. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, don't do the millennial pause. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. <laughs> I cracked up when I was there. But no, uh, but no, seriously, the um, you know, you know, I I had heard something, I saw something actually I saw it on social media actually, where it was uh, someone had posted something, right? And it said that, you know, the res was never devoid of talent, it was always devoid of resources. Right. And I think that, you know, what the thing about TikTok, and that's not, you know, this to be completely transparent about, it, just to be honest, right? It's an entertainment app, hands down, right? That was the point of this app was to be entertaining, blah, 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 blah. Right. And so I think that, you know, being able to paint or like or or present a a human aspect to these things. It gets super look, it's one thing if you're sitting in, and, and reading a newspaper or you're watching something on TV and they're covering a story, whether about missing or indigenous women or about the mascot thing, right? That's one thing. But able to sit down and have this kind of like, you know, almost it's a very interpersonal moment when you're staring at a camera and you're and you're making this and you're able to put a face to that particular thing that it is that you're talking about there's a huge power there that comes with you know adding that human element into these into these things you know i think that you know and that's the reason why you know and i you know christina talked about it here just a second ago right which which is but you know to make it um you know you have that that, that small window you have three seconds to capture someone's attention right on the app you know the app is something it's, i tell people it's a it's not a slow trickling uh, stream, it's a raging river. Everything moves by very, 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 very fast. So you have to be a little bit quick on, on the draw on, on some things in that sense. But, um, you know, by being able to uh, have that, uh, for me personally, right, my 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 uh, evolution through the app has always started with just making these silly, dumb comedy little bits. And then eventually over time, right, I was, I was able to, to put a face to it, right? People understand the personality. And they understand they start seeing me as a person rather than just a face faceless person on on this on some random app, right? And being able to uh, you know get a, present that human element where you can sit down and really address you know people um, uh, in a very um, I, I, I'm sorry the word keeps escaping me. Um, well, I'm intimate, right? In a very like, very like, intimate type of way, and that to me has been very very impactful, very very powerful. You know. Um, one of the things that I personally, you know, you know took uh, handled something I, I, a year or two ago was the same thing. It was the mascot thing. I lived in the state of Indiana. The state of Indiana is less than one percent Indigenous identifying people. Right, we're very, very small. There's not a whole lot of us around, and so these, these types of behaviors typically go unchecked or unchallenged. And so, you know, there's a high school here, local high school, that has this little, you know, fake pipe ceremony thing they did at halftime at the basketball court. It was a big old thing. Right, and uh, as 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 an indigenous person, I was, I was able to create this this video and talk about how problematic this is, right? How how incredibly um, uh, 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 powerful these people don't understand how powerful those things can be for indigenous people, and the way that it drives down our, you know, it 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 increases depression. Our, our academic study goes down when we have kids who are being raised around indigenous mascots, right? We have there's all kinds of there's all kinds of study and science and data to back this. And no one's ever been told that before. And if they have been told, it's always been through again a newscast or or or, or an article online. Again, not say that those things don't carry weight because they most certainly do. It's just there's no face to it. There's no one talking to you about this, right? So it has this kind of vibe of like being able to, like, like you're talking to a friend. It's just kind of the way that I see it, right? People, we have like though a lot of followers and things happen, people tend to, to listen to you a little bit more um, than they would if they're listening, you know, to, you know, Tom Brokaw or whoever's on the thing now, they don't know who it is, but you know, they don't want really to care about it. They want to hear this, right? And so, you know, and just with the way that uh, media is today too, um, most people get their, 
information from these apps. They get you know get these things, and they're able to break it down in a in a way that you understand, right? That you don't get only gets lost in the sauce, only gets lost in the terminology. You can just say blatantly, "Hey, this is what it is." Right. And you can see the physical reactions that come with someone explaining it to you who has invested, who has skin in that game, like myself and everyone on here. Right. So uh, that's been for me kind of how, how I've done it and how my mind has been processing. How do I address this? How do I make this feel like you're talking to somebody and not to something or to a network or to a, you know, a news article? You're talking to a person. That's beautiful. And I love how you really kind of took us through your journey on social media and how you're doing something really specific. But once you really started to build that following and really get that engagement, then you were able to, like you said, trans transition to like, this is me behind this content, you know, this content, these are the things that I'm holding and really being able to capture the audience in that way. So I've always thought about that, you know, some of those really big content creator influencers who have such a large following and you don't really hear them talking about any of their you know political or social economical beliefs right and I just think what a what a missed opportunity but I, I think that's what's so cool again about TikTok like you said this intimacy that it allows it's like you're inviting people into your living room right like you're sitting down at the table with folks right and it, it allows that you know that personal exchange which is so important um Simona we'd love to hear from you Me, I'm um, I'm confrontational, so I use it as a means to um, counter the dominant narrative. Um, a lot of people think that you know we're a monolith, and we're not, and that goes for um, other things such as like being you know an urban native, and then me being Afro Indigenous. It's, I have a different lens to offer, and sometimes it's fun to offer it and challenge what they their beliefs are and sometimes they actually listen sometimes they push back um but i that's okay you know you kind of learn you kind of give and take from each other that's what i like about tiktok that's right because when we're talking about this dominant narrative or belief system that we're living in right um we have this opportunity through our phones and through these social media platforms to tell our own narrative right and to be able to break that down and those stereotypes that Che hit on that are so harmful when we're talking about our mental health and we're talking about our well-being right um so it's so beautiful to hear how you all are leveraging the, the ether you know that's what I call the internet the ether <laughs> this the space where we're all existing on, right? Um, and I love to, to hear just your different styles and approaches in that. And I think we can all agree that TikTok is a means for increasing civic engagement. That's what I'm really hearing. But I'd love to hear how you've seen that impact. Like that is the intention to increase civic impact, but what have you seen happen because of TikTok in, in regards to civic engagement for you personally, if you have any, any testimonies to that? I, um, so I always praise the work in Arizona that um, the indigenous population had organized, um, folks on Navajo Nation rode horses to the ballots, um, and the organization and just community grassroots level that goes on over there um, is really amazing to see, um, and they even elected, uh, you know, Katie Hobbs as governor um, and switched that uh, position, but also getting like um, Senator uh, Kelly, I think that's his name, um, to Congress um, and electing folks who are working with tribal nations. I remember listening to KTNN and hearing uh, Senator Mike Kelly's uh, campaign advertisements on the radio. And I was just like, you know, you just don't really see that, um, but we need to also encourage that. But that's the unfortunate part of politics. If your, I guess, subgroup comes out to vote, then you get more of that money and outlet to civic engagement. But it's also somewhat scary, I, I would say to folks that, you know, we're forced to be reckoned with. And um, no one really predicted that us indigenous peoples were gonna, we're gonna come out and show up like that. So um, I know there's been some chatter here in Kansas. Um, I do wanna recognize that because I'm Navajo and Diné, I am a guest in this Great Plains area to the indigenous folks here. So I do what they tell me to do um, and help empower them through their communities on how they'd like to get civically engaged. Um, but it's still such a big ask for our people 
to trust a system that wanted us dead, that wanted us gone, that still passes racist uh, policies, um, that it's such a big ass ask our people to be involved in this political process. Um, so, you know, how do we help navigate through these systems? How do we, um, you know, have the plan for change, um, but also at the same time, uplift our tribal sovereignties and our um, tribal government entities at the same time. So that's a really fun uh, position that I get to do at the Kansas State Legislature um, when we're passing bills that we need to make sure we don't step on the toes of our tribal nations. They can govern themselves. Um, and if there's an issue, let's bring them in. Don't, don't look at me. <laughs> I am not an elected official of these four tribes of Kansas. Um, so we're trying to work on those partnerships together. And I know um, in government to tribal consultation, oh my goodness, um, that at the bare minimum of all issues that we need to focus on is um, such a big task. I think that the federal government is really trying to uh, set guidelines so we don't have um, assumptions of tribal consultation. So yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for just describing how you're really walking in these two worlds and how challenging that can be in, in that position. And also acknowledging the fear that folks may feel, um, you know, in civic engagement in relation to, like you said, a government who wanted us dead, right? It was killed the Indian, save the man, right? Um, and so now it's like, okay, what does that look like to really be able to bridge to bridge that gap? And I think even with consultation, that's something I've been holding outside of the Urban Indigenous Collective. I'm also part of the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund that does a lot of work around supporting bio bioculture conservation. And when we see the psychedelic renaissance happening right now, we see a lot of issues there. So we have been really thinking about how we can leverage our social media and tech talk to really be able to get people understanding what free prior and informed consent means and how we really honor that process. So thank you for naming that. That's so important. Simone, I really saw you bobbing your head over there and moving your body, a lot of body language. So I think you might have something to say. <laughs> I do. I do. I want to commend you on the um, just acknowledging protocol. And I, I tell that to everybody. When we enter new spaces, there is protocol. Have you asked the people of the lands? Have you asked their permission to even throw these marches, to even do any of that? Has it even occurred to anybody? And most of the times it hasn't. And um, sometimes we forget too when we enter another uh, territory that you know there are protocol and we need to respect the protocol of that land. So thank you for for saying that. And just want to open it up to see if anyone else wants to talk about how their TikTok has impacted civic engagement. If not, we can move on to the next question. Millennial pause. Okay. <laughs> I got, I, I got, I got you. So, okay. uh, <laughs> um, no, I think that, I mean, again, right. So the whole point, uh, well, not the whole point, but one of the big things again, is lifting this veil of invisibility. And there's a lot of things that I've seen over the last couple of years that I've been on the platform that, um, I, I'm going to be honest, you know, I'm not sure if it would be, have been is as impactful if it wasn't for indigenous creators. And more recently, I keep, like, I refer back to like ICWA, like that was a big one. ICWA was a huge thing. And I, and I, I thought all over TikTok and, you know, and 90% and of the people who ever came across that had no idea it was even a thing. They had no idea what it was. They didn't know why it was important. Right. And so, you know, creating this, that this engagement uh, with the followers that then turned into signatures, they turned into support, they stayed, they turned into, um, you know, rallies and, 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 or whatever, right. They, they turned into like real action. You know, I, there was, I saw, I mean, 10, 12 different petitions roll around. I saw one that had 102,000 votes in a month. Right. I mean, I, I would, without this type of, again, uh, visibility through these platforms and these creators have built these bases or have, uh, had, Created virtual space to have these conversations, to have live videos where they're sitting there and they're talking to each other from halfway across the country live, much like we're doing right now, right? And being able to have this. And I think even right now, this is a perfect example of civic engagement created by TikTok. We're having this conversation because of this, because of creators, because of TikTok's this platform. And what we're and we're we're still, we're still understanding it. We're, we still don't have a. We're still learning this process. There's a lot of hiccups that I see every now and again, but you know, I it's. 
without this, with that, without this, I don't think those, you know, I'm not saying it, it would have gotten done regardless, I feel, but I, I think that this has been a massive tool, a huge, huge tool to, uh, to um, allowing things like ICWA to have such, you know, attention brought to it when it was been attacked in the past, right? I mean, those things have happened and these things have gone under the radar for many years and no one has ever, you know, most people don't even know, didn't even know it existed yet alone that it was challenged or anything like that, right? Um, you know, the uh, boarding school, residential school things, I think that's another thing too, right? Um, talking about what that is and and bringing to light this thing to now they're holding, you know, visuals, they're, 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 they are sending back, you know, uh, I was just, I was just at something this past summer where they had brought a little girl back to her tribe um, since um, I can't remember the exact year, but it was like, you know, like, like 1850 something, right? Been completely gone this whole time. And the US Army then finally coughed mm -hmm. up her remains and gave, you know, a little headstone and brought it back to the nation. And uh, there was a campaign to make that happen. There was a campaign that was that was done in virtual space and in person, but the virtual space was a part of this to, to, to bring attention, to, to pressure the army enough to finally do this after a hundred some years, right? So, I mean, I'm seeing, and that what comes with that is a ton of healing. What comes with that is a lot uh, of, again, of these conversations. Um, and uh, and I think that, you know, there's, it's just, it's, 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 it's had such an impact across so many, so many different aspects. Um, but those are the ones that for me stick out the most and that are still big conversations that we're continuing to have and continuing to discover. Absolutely. And I, and I hear you really, you know, talking about this invisibility that we're experiencing, right? And of course, that benefits the government if we stay invisible and quiet, right, and meek. Um, but what we're seeing is social media and TikTok is allowing for this new level of visibility to really be able to share our voices, share our opinions and ensure that people understand what's going on. Because there is a lot of ignorance, right? Because of a lack of ed education, because of that, that invisibility that we're experiencing, that erasure, let's just call it that erasure straight up, right? Um, but I even see that within Lenape Hoking in New York City, right? Where we have one of the largest populations of urban natives, over 180,000 indigenous peoples, right? And um, we're also including our brothers and sisters that are, you know, north and south of the borders as well there. Um, but people don't know that, you know, I graduated from NYU and I tell my professors who are supposed to be, you know, so uh, part of community and public health, my master's is in public health but no idea that such a large population of natives is here, right here in Lenape Hoking, or even the tribes that are out on Long Island, right? And so I think there's this really, again, this opportunity that we can really leverage the social media to really increase this awareness, increase the visibility, to really be able to support decolonizing these spaces and then in turn indigenizing them. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, um, just the, the, the good parts of TikTok and I'd love to open it up to ask you all, like, what are your favorite parts if we haven't touched on it? But I think it's twofold because we also have to talk about what are the challenges that you face? And I'm sure that there are a number of challenges that you run into um, on TikTok. So let's talk about it. This one I can start with. Um, my favorite, favorite part is I don't feel alone. Like it's hard for me to find indigenous folk, you know? And so it's, oh, I can relate to that story. Oh my gosh, I'm not the only one who feels that way, you know? It's that bonding, that healing, um, creating just kinship, you know? Um, and the part that I dislike is being Afro-Indigenous, there's an algorithm that kind of silences our voices. Um, uh, the Black voices on TikTok, it kind of knocked out of the algorithm a lot. So that's the part that I don't like. The part that I really like is um, as Native people, we get through everything through humor. Um, and I think that's just so instilled um, in our culture. And I even get in trouble sometimes in my workplace for like doing a little laugh or giggle um, in serious situations. Cause like, that's how we get through trauma. That's how we <laughs> get through life um, is through teasing and through just like making fun of the situation. Um, and so I think a lot of the TikToks that I enjoy are skits, um, 
And, you know, I didn't grow up on the res. Um, I think we all have experiences with, uh, you know, like getting the hot Cheetos and um, pickles and, you know, in New Mexico, the burritos are good. Um, <laughs> and just like kind of bringing that back, because I really feel like um, talking in my personal experience, I'm working in a very uh, white place, a very place that's not welcoming of who I was and historically hasn't been. I'm currently the only Native American state legislator in Kansas um, and one of the youngest across the country. So who who do I have to help, um, you know, lean on uh, for similar experiences? Not a lot of people. Um, so through humor, it really just brings me back um, to, you know, just praying, running, uh, and these uh, practices that are so deeply ingrained into me um, during these really tough situations. And I remember the first time I ran for office on election day, I was just like, you know, it's all out of my hands at this point. My mom's like, I see you, you know, you're pacing around, go run. And I'm like, okay, fine. So um, when, when did that and just felt a lot better. Um, and I would say one of the negative issues is that uh, sometimes, um, you know, we will share our issues and our personal stories, um, but people uh, might not be the best allies. And that could be really difficult. Um, but also I would just say in, in general too, like people just don't know enough. They're not educated enough on indigenous issues or histories. And I see this in government too, when we talk about an indigenous issue like missing murder indigenous peoples um, or like tribal economic and sovereignty, when you just talk to someone, it's not like you have to start from 1492. Like you have to go all the way back. Then that's like 15 minutes of the meeting. Um, and that's, you know, we can't get to the root issues. So I feel like that's one of the barriers when we're um, trying to educate on indigenous issues is that we, we're just so doing this heavy lift and we really need our allies a lot of times to help lift with us. So we don't get exhausted, right? Because this you can easily get burnt out from this type of work. So we need to take care of ourselves. That's right. There's a lot of education and emotional labor that falls on us. And you know, you even saying we have to start from such a long time ago, right? To be able to get people up to speed. It's almost as if that should be a part of our education system, huh? <laughs> Jay, I would love to hear from you um, in regards to just what you love about TikTok and some of the challenges that you faced. Well, you know, one of the things is that uh, that I love, that I, one thing that I really love about TikTok is the fact that, you know, in most, I feel like in, in, in most uh, non-Indigenous people's eyes, when you hear uh, about the Native the native story, the story of indigenous people, it's, it's one of tragedy. They talk, they, they, they know about the genocide, they know about the, you know, the eradications, they know about the diseases, like, you know, all the, that seems to be a lot of what people think about. Um, but what they really don't see is the, is, is, is the beauty that exists today. Like, you know, they don't really, they don't, they don't really ever think about that, right? They, when someone thinks about indigenous people, they usually have a really, really bad stereotype or, you know, they're thinking about what they, you know, saw or read about this genocide thing that happened or whatever, right? That's in their mind, that's how they think about it. And so they don't really get a chance to see the artistry, the talent, the the pride, the, um, the, the talent, you know, like they don't really see a whole lot of that or the, or the, the, the power, right? Like there's, there's very little as, much, as powerful impact that I've had that uh, I could not contribute to an indigenous woman, right? Like indigenous women are just one of the most powerful speakers on the planet. And so, you know, I'm not, and, and so being able to, 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 to sit down and listen to these, to these women or to, to these elders or to these two spirited or whatever like that, you know, they don't really get, they don't really get that exposure. And so TikTok is really pre presented a platform where you're able again, to sit there and see this and witness it and see all the beautiful things that come with being an indigenous person. There's so much to be thanked. There's so much that we have that, you know, that um, is truly um, um, just that powerful. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, like I said, and then the flip side of that, right, the negative is that kind of like what everyone kind of touched face on is that it is an emotional labor. It is very, very difficult to keep up sometimes, um, you know, because you have, 
one of the big things that we're seeing now is a lot of reconnecting indigenous people and people who want to be allies. And one of the things is that they don't really take, you know, sometimes they don't really always take into consideration is time and mental space from our creators or time and mental space from our leaders or time and mental space from our elders. You know, they don't really think about that sometimes. And so it could be really difficult to try to sit there and have the same conversation day over day over day with different side of people. Um, and it could be, uh, it's also, it also can be very, it can be also be a very much dangerous place because racism is definitely a, a, a prevalence here. It is something that's very, that, that I experience every single day on this platform. It's, it's, it's an unfortunate thing, you know, um, that we still see. And so, you know, there's still always going to be threats from people who just don't like you just because of who you are, right? Uh, because of whatever reason, um, you know, there could be death threats, there could be um, you know, you can, they try to dox you out or they try to do this or try to do that because you shared an opinion or you shared something that that offended them or threatened any whatever type of fragility they may have, um, despite it being our truth and the truth. Um, you know, those are some things that that, you know, for those people who have families and have have communities, you know, they're, they're, there's, you have to kind of be careful about that a little bit. Um, and that's something, again, I saw that in Standing Rock. I saw that, you know, through all the independent media posting we saw on Facebook at that time. I'm seeing it on TikTok and I'm seeing it on Instagram, right? It's something that happens. It's a it's kind of an always an underlying thing that you have to take into consideration is you have to protect yourself. And that being in a constant state of protection can sometimes be very exhausting uh for uh for 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 for, for some of us. And so being able to take the time to break away and go back again and maybe ceremonially, spiritually, culturally ground yourself and protect yourself in that sense while also having the physical aspect to like physically protecting yourself physically you know uh separating yourself sometimes if you absolutely need to uh that's a lot of work that's a ton of work just to relay a truth just to relay a message right just to, to help engagement or help someone out there someone something right um it can be very it can be very very hard so that's one of the things i think that i i wish it was different I wish it was different. Um, it's just the way that it is, though. It's something that we, as creators and as influencers, or however you want to label it, um, is is a very real thing. Such an important, uh, yeah, topic and, and points that you're hitting on there, especially when you might consider academia and they're hyper focused on our traumas. You know, we're always talking about ACEs and the adverse childhood experiences, but what we are missing is our resilience and our ability to be here today is a testament to our survival and the resilience that we have and carry and the traditions and the cultures that we have. So I, I really love that. There needs to be a shift from all of the traumas we've experienced. We need to acknowledge them, but also how beautiful and resilient we are as people. Um, I really love that. But of course, also there are always gonna be the trolls. Always someone is going to have something to say, especially if they are behind a keyboard, right? We, we uh, that's I'm sure something we've, all the experience, but again, just really focusing on just the beauty and the resilience of, of our communities. Um, we should probably get into some Q&A. We're getting to the end of time here. Um, I'm not seeing any, let's see, questions though. Oh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, what is your favorite new trend with indigenous TikTok? Ah, uh, okay. So I think um, one of my favorite trends, and I, I don't know if it's say it's new, but one of the things that I that one I always remember is when they had like the Indigenous Language Challenge, where they're going through and then challenging people to like learn how to introduce yourself in your traditional language. I thought that was really, I thought that was really cool. I enjoyed. I watched like a billion of those videos. I thought they were super, super cool. Um, you know, I I really enjoyed that. Um, I like when they indigenize existing trends. That's for me is a huge thing. I like like they have like a dance challenge and someone will do it, but like in powwow regalia, right? Respectfully, of course, but they're still do it. And I and I and I love that. Again, I like being able to to say that these things, there is there is the bigger message behind that for me is that there's always room for for indigenous people in these spaces, in these trends or whatever. Like just it's it's who you are and bring it into there. Like do it, man. You know what I mean? So I really, I always really enjoy those. And uh, I think recently I've seen a few of those. And they would take trending like funny sounds and do it um in that way too. Um and just kind of indigenize those things. I I can't get enough of it. I think those things are uh are currently I always currently and always have been my one of my favorite things. Mm, beautiful. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I 
I'm having trouble thinking of a particular trend, um, but I love watching. Um, I think powwow season's kind of wrapping up a bit, and I really enjoyed um, all the youth uh, showing their dancing at powwows. And I think there were some younger folks who were doing like interviews and asking, <laughs> like, you know, what's your favorite five bread stand, um, or uh, kind of picking up on trends of like middle school and high school. Um, do you think so-and-so is like, you know, a good dancer and then they go to the next dancer and they're like, uh, they're okay. So I don't know. It's just really nice to see the youth um, use the platform for community um, and just like native humor. Um, and it's really cool to see other tribal nations use TikTok. Um, I don't know if there's any other tribal nations who have an official TikTok account, but all I could really find was Cherokee Nation. Um, and they really use that to showcase like their culture, their powwows, stickball, um, you know, the sports that they have. Um, and it's really cool just to, um, you know, when that shows up on your For You page um, and just to keep current on, on the everyday things of that. Um, and I really love watching, so I live in Lawrence, Haskell Nations University, um, I was alumni there. So I love just like hashtagging and seeing what the students are doing up over there. Um, love me some uh, gym TikTok, native gym TikTok. Um, I'm a public health person as well um, by trade. So I love seeing those healthy habits. Um, and it really inspires me um, when I see, you know, like a native, uh person lifting weights or like indigenizing your uh dinner plate um or making um I saw someone making like uh kneel down bread in their oven which is a Navajo dish and it's like as an urban person it's like how do you do that without like a earth oven um so I love just watching uh you know these I guess what we would say normal but like indigenizing and decolonizing it um and and educating folks as well Beautiful, thank you. Um, the trends that I like are the lives when they go on live and they beat. I want to learn how to be better. So I'm sitting there and I'm with my needle trying to keep up and go along with it. And um, they're open to questions. They're open at, you know, you ask questions like, what am I doing wrong? Why are my beads loose? You know, <laughs> why am I pulling it? It's just bending. Like, what am I doing wrong? And they're so kind about it. You know, um, sometimes I feel like I have imposter syndrome because I'm an urban native and I feel like some things I should know, but they're they're just real kind and they guide me along the way with it, you know, and um, they encourage me. They're just like, yeah, keep it up. Just keep going, you know, and show me the different ways to do patterns. I really like that. Um, the other favorite part is uh, open verse challenge. I just love open verse challenge. I mean, it's like a free space for artists to jump on somebody else's music with a section to add your own music, you know, your own poetry, your own words to their music. And it's, I think that's just one of the dopest things because it allows creativity. Thank you for just sharing that. And also just touching on like being able to, to learn how to bead from TikTok. I think that's so incredible because the reality is, and I had a conversation yesterday is we weren't born knowing all of our traditions, all of our songs, all of our ways. And that is, you know, part of our family and our community who teaches us those things. And so I see that as TikTok as an extension of that family and that kinship to be able to introduce some of those techniques of beadwork, you know, back to us. And that's, that's so beautiful. Um, one more question to end this amazing panel. This has been such an incredible discussion, but I would love to just ask what can the average person do to take action to both support indigenous TikTok uh, creators and strengthen sovereignty? I think one of the biggest ways you can support indigenous creators is to pay them um, and to partner with them um, and to, uh, you know, I had this great opportunity to work with Advanced Native American Political Leadership as a fellow, and we partner with TikTok creators, and we, um, you know, I reached out to creators um, and asked for their rates, um, and to really, you know, there are a lot of them were like, this is my first time being asked to work in a partnership and to be paid, um, so I would really like to see Indigenous creators um, lean into this profession and to um, really just 
receive what they deserve to get like get back um and for other folks um to support i guess being a good indigenous ally is to educate yourself to show up um especially in social media leave a like leave a comment a positive comment um but also if there's some um you know remarks that are not very uh nice i will say um defend that creator um it goes a lot i, I it's really true if you have a bad comment it really can linger in your head, but when you have that one person, it's like, hey, you're out of line. Um, it really just helps ease that burden a little bit because it takes a lot to um, create a video, to post it, to edit it. It takes a lot of um, courage, a lot of um, self-confidence, um, and we want to help and encourage our Indigenous creators and starting creators to continue on um, sharing their personal experiences and their culture. That's right. And I love that you named pay these creators, pay these leaders, right? We're done with exploiting land and labor. And that is for content creators also, right? Um, and that's a larger discussion, you know, I think we could have too, of uh, just really being able to use our voices to share that we're, we're, uh, we're asking for resources to support this work as well. So it also sounds like share, 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 and uh, show up when you see some bullying happening online, right? Like, how are you really being an ally? Um, yeah, we'll turn it over to Simona Che. Um, uplift Native voices, listen to Native voices, like listen and um, don't take our stories and run with it. Actually turn around and actually uplift that story, that person that you are talking about, get consent. <laughs> um, see us basically just you know we exist see us very cool thank you and che our final words here uh you know one of the things that i see on 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 tiktok that um i think people you know need to need to need to remember is that a lot of these people a lot of these careers that are on there are also they're also business owners right they're business owners they're entrepreneurs entrepreneurs they're 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 selling beadwork they're selling native art they're putting out shirts they're creating music they're doing all kinds of things and you know um so supporting our indigenous business owners right and supporting our indigenous uh entrepreneurs buy something right makes uh a, a share something right that so many of these people they they are really investing a lot of their time and effort and energy into creating their artwork right um you know, as a as, as an indigenous person, as a Navajo, you know, we understand that, you know, when you when you when you make a blanket, right, a piece of you stays in that blanket unless you release it, right? You know, it, you a part of your soul goes into that. Part of your spirit goes into the things that you create. And your part of your story goes into the things that you create. And so when people are putting that out there and 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 they're really trying to uh support their families, they're trying to support their communities, they're trying to do things like that. And um, and so for people who are are looking for those, uh, you know, for that, uh, a, a gift or for, you know, I don't know, holidays or something, I don't know, you know, but go back and, 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 and follow these people, support them by again, liking, sharing, whatever the content, right. Do all the normal things, but actually make sure you're, you know, buy something <laughs> like, buy, you know, support their, support their businesses. You know, um, one of the big things that we've been fighting for, for a long time is making sure that our artwork is made by actual indigenous people. Right. That's a huge thing. Having having, you know, buying buying native. I think that's a huge, huge thing. And I see so many people who are they're they're putting their all into making these things and they have TikTok accounts, they have Instagram accounts, they have Facebook accounts. Right. And uh, they're putting out some so much incredible work and they're doing such great things. And, um, you know, and. People don't see it as a luxury product or people don't see it as, uh, you know, they, they want a deal. So they're buying off of Amazon. Right. So I think, you know, being able to actually support real indigenous business businesses and real indigenous artists is, is a really big thing. When you're on TikTok and you're doing stuff in this sense, you are in, in sense, whether you're a spoken word, whether you're, a, you know, a, a, a politician or whatever, when you're doing and you're editing a video in that moment, you're an artist and you are doing art things. And so you, you have to support our indigenous artists who are on and performers and entertainers and voices. And I think that's the best way we can do it is, is to actually legitimately support it buy something shares and, and and like their stuff and recommend them to people around you 
Thank you. And I know we're at time now, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michaela. Thank you so much, the Native Governance Center. We are so thankful for this platform and this opportunity to be able to have this really powerful discussion. Yako, Michaela. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sutton, as our host, and uh, Representative Hoswood, Simona, Che. Uh, this has really just been a really great conversation. I've been over here, like, really vibing on everything that you all are saying. So just really grateful to have your experiences, your expertise here. Uh, so again, Wopalatanka to our panelists and hosts. Uh, also, thank you to those of you who attended today's virtual event. We hope you feel inspired to continue learning about these issues and share information information with members of your community. If you learned something today and enjoyed the event, consider making a contribution to Native Governance Center so we can continue to bring you this great content. Visit our website, nativegov.org, to donate. Additionally, we'd really love to hear from you all, so we'll email a survey to our Zoom attendees and also post a link in the Facebook comment section as well. Stay tuned for our future virtual events. Our next event is slated for late fall, and we plan to announce our topic and speakers very soon. Many blessings to you all, and thank you again so much for attending our virtual event today.